Mr. De Grey. Hi. Hello. Good to meet you. I'm Boss. Hello, Hi. Boss. This is my wife, Adelaide. Nice to meet you. You are often uh, being described as an immortalist. Is that a term that fits you, or is it a misnomer? It's really rather a misnomer, to be honest. I don't really work on immortality. Mm -hmm. I don't really work on longevity, even. Mm. I work on health. Mm. I'm interested in developing new medicines that will keep people in full physical and mental performance however long ago they were born. So I'm interested in better medicines for the sickness that is currently associated with old age. Mm -hmm. And yes, I certainly foresee that if we are successful in the approach that we are taking, then we will see a big side effect in mm -hmm. terms of longevity. But it's still a side effect, however big it may be. And what sort of side effect do you think of then? Well, so people will live longer. People always live longer if they are healthier because yes. getting sick is the main reason why people die. Yes. Uh, so if we keep people really healthy for uh, however long they live, then the risk of death does not go up every, with every year that goes by the way it does today. And that means that people have a good chance to live quite a lot longer. But of course, we cannot say how much longer okay. because the actual time will then depend on one's risk of death from other causes. Mm. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not working on stopping people from being hit by trucks. Okay. But, but your work is, is surrounded by wild speculations about living a thousand years longer or... or, 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 you, or you well, if you actually try to do the mathematics on this, making whatever assumptions you may choose to make, like, you know, car accidents will become less common, things like that, then, of course, you can come up with some number or other. And it turns out that it's quite easy to come up with numbers that are at least as big as a thousand. So, you know, it's not really wild speculation. It's just what we would expect from the impact of the therapies that we're working on. Can you explain uh, to me a little bit about the basic tenets of your ideas about, uh, and how you came to uh, develop them? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward what we do. We are interested in repairing the damage of aging. Mm. So in order to explain that, all I really need to do is tell you what the damage of aging is. The human body is a machine, and just like any simple man-made machine, like a car or whatever, the human body damages itself as an inevitable byproduct of its normal operation. That's just going to happen. So... Again, like any simple machine, the human body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that damage, and that's why our bodies function at pretty much full performance, both physically and mentally, for a long time. But eventually, the amount of damage exceeds what we are set up to tolerate, and that's when the ill health of old age starts to emerge and to progress. And what kind of damage? So then, okay, so the damage uh, that happens is at the molecular and cellular level. Things like cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells, or simple molecular byproducts of certain metabolic processes that accumulate because the body doesn't have a system for getting rid of them. If we can develop ways not to stop the damage from being created, which is really, really hard to do, but rather to repair the damage reasonably thoroughly every so often, then we will achieve the necessary objective. We will stop the damage from reaching a level of abundance that is bad for you. So that will mean that everybody will be a patient in, in a sense? Everybody's already a patient. Okay. We're all getting sick. We've all got aging. Mm -hmm. The question is what to do about it. Okay. So you see aging basically as, a, as an illness? Aging is a medical problem. It's bad for you. So, uh, listening to you, I get the idea you're, you're not the messianic type, that you're often uh, are portrayed as, uh, but you are predicting in a more measured uh, way that this longevity will not be a kind of what they call the singularity, one explosion of knowledge that will bring us into a whole different realm of being, but will be a much slower process than... Well, I'm not saying it's going to be slow, mm. but yeah, you're right. Uh, messianic representations of people sell papers, so perhaps that's why it happens. Um, uh, the uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just a medical researcher. You know, I'm just putting together new ideas to deal with the medical problems that face us in the world today, and I do feel that there is likely to be a rather sharp tipping point when we reach a sufficient level of comprehensiveness of these repair therapies, these rejuvenation therapies, so that we are staying one step ahead of the problem, if you like. Mm -hmm. So 
Because these therapies that we're working to develop are repair therapies, what they effectively will do is rejuvenate the body. They will turn someone into having a biological age, if you like, that is lower, younger than it was before the therapies were mm. administered. Now, what that means is that if we administer these therapies periodically, then we will be able to maintain someone's biological age at uh, young adulthood, let's say 30, um, however long they live. So it's kind of maintenance. It's really exactly preventative maintenance, just the same way that we do on a car or an aeroplane. And of course, the thing is that we already know from cars, for example, that this works really well. Mm -hmm. We have cars driving around today which are more than 100 years old. They were not designed to last 100 years. Those cars were designed to last 10 or 15 years. And the reason they've lasted so much longer is preventative maintenance. Mm. Do you believe in cryonics? Well, of course, I don't like the idea of do I believe in a technology? Uh, the, uh, I, I prefer to be more precise and say do I believe that there is a chance that cryonics can work? The concept here is, of course, that people might be in a state where today's medicine, let alone yesterday's medicine, mm -hmm. is unable to revive them, but they're only a little bit beyond the state where today's medicine can help them. If we can keep them in that state and not have them accumulate further damage as a result, for example, of the fact that their heart is not beating anymore, mm -hmm. then um, future medicine may be able to do better. Mm -hmm. In other words, these people may look as though they're dead, but they may not actually be dead. Okay. And we won't know until we try. Mm -hmm. But since we have this very straightforward method of allowing ourselves to try, yes. namely taking these people down to a very, very low temperature so that further damage does not accumulate then it seems that there might be a chance. And I believe that now we are at a point where it is indeed realistic that people who are cryopreserved in the absolute best possible quality that can be achieved today have a significant chance of, being, of benefiting from future medicine. So it's less, uh, less, less a gamble, you could say, than, than it used to be. I would say that it's still an enormous gamble. Um, and indeed, most people who sign up to be cryopreserved do so on the basis of the conclusion that any odds is better than zero. It's better than some people. One, 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 of, one of the more prominent cryonicists once said that um, cryopreservation is the second worst thing that can happen to you. Okay. Are, are you planning it yourself? I'm signed up with one of the cryonics companies, certainly. Okay. And, and is it what will be preserved? Uh, your whole body? or is At the moment, I am signed up only to have my head preserved, okay. but I may change that. Your projections, from what I've read, is that a lot of problems remain to be solved. And probably in, in this current state you're in, you will not uh, live to see it. I am not motivated mainly by personal ambition to benefit from this work. Okay. Certainly I would like to, but it's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. And what does What gets me out of bed in the morning is the humanitarian aspect, mm -hmm. the sheer number of people who will benefit. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is really just mathematical. I say, well, these therapies are going to happen sometime. Maybe they will happen soon enough for me. Maybe they won't. My own work may improve my own probability of making the cut by a few percent, if I'm lucky. But... A few percent is not something to get worked up about. Whereas, if I think about the overall global benefit, then I can reflect on the fact that for every single day that I bring forward the defeat of aging, I'm saving 100,000 lives. That's mm -hmm. the number of people mm -hmm. who die of aging every day worldwide. Hmm. Reading about reactions to your work, it seems that people... Um, are not only afraid of dying, but are sometimes, or a lot of people are afraid of not dying in the sense that they resist the kind of implications of your work. Yes. I'm not too surprised at the ambivalence that people have because until very recently, really until I came along, we didn't have, the field did not have any kind of plan for how we might develop medicines that would truly bring aging under medical control. And that meant that we didn't have any kind of estimate for how long it might take to achieve that goal. So, you know, that means that for practical purposes, the goal is impossible. Now, 
most people just, you know, if they have the choice of spending their lives being preoccupied by this terrible thing that's going to happen to them in the future, all this disease and disability and suffering, um, or else they have the option to put it out of their minds, then obviously they will try to put it out of their minds and get on with their miserably short lives and hope for the best. Most people, when they're confronted by illness or death, they panic or they or are very sad or you know, they don't want to die, basically. But on the other level, on a more abstract philosophical level, they, they tend to say death has a meaning, it gives life meaning. That's the, the obvious. Uh, yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Um, I mean, of course, the way I see this is very much the same as the sociological excuses like, oh, won't dictators live forever? You know, again, they are um, uh, just trumped up ideas to try to pretend that aging is a blessing in disguise. Uh, but in fact, there is absolutely no logical basis for the idea that death gives meaning to life. It makes no sense at all. What would be the biggest change, you think, if, if people uh, get used to this longevity? It's perfectly clear. The biggest change in society as a result of therapies that stop people from getting sick when they get old is that we will have very few people who are sick. Yes. And it will, the world will be much happier, the world will be much more prosperous because we won't be spending all this money on people who are sick. The people who would, would have been sick will be still contributing wealth to society, contributing in every way to society. Um, the world will be a better place. But, but we'll get a lot of more people. Well, not necessarily. Um, that's a big objection, of course, that people often say, you know, oh dear, where, where, where will we put all the people? We have to remember, first of all, that the global population is rising more and more slowly as time goes on because the bigger countries in the world have a falling fertility rate. The average woman is having fewer children. The average woman is also having her children later. And when we don't have menopause anymore, the average woman may have their first child at the age of 100, you mm. know, because they're making those choices because there are other things they want to do before they do this terrible time-consuming thing. And so, you know, the attitudes that we will have in the distant future cannot be predicted. And I do not believe it's profitable or productive to try to base our decisions today on whether we should try to solve the problems that we have today on some speculation about how things will be in 500 years. Mm -hmm.